right. That was a cool intro. It took me like three hours to make that, so I had to show it. <laughs> but hey, everybody, thank you so much for letting me be part of this program. Uh, excited to be here talking to you about MIGs, one of my favorite topics. So it's me, you know, MIGs rapid fire. For a lot of these, a lot of you who know me, I like to speak fast, and so I apologize ahead of time if I go pretty quickly. There's a lot of data, a lot of information I want to share with you in this next 40 minutes or so. But I'm from Wisconsin. I'm a cheesehead, and uh, we'll get to that in a second. But I want to make sure you all realize I do speak and consult for a number of the companies in the glaucoma anterior segment space. And this is my disclosure slides here. I'll be speaking about some of the products that are listed from these companies as well. But I'm from Wisconsin. I'm actually here right now in Wisconsin in Kenosha. And uh, I'm actually a cheese head. So those of you guys who don't know cheese heads, we love our cheese. In fact, that is a cheese head that's customized to fit over my turban. So my parents told me that I would never forget my roots as a Wisconsinite. Uh, but it's great to be back here in Wisconsin. I grew up in, in this area and we love our cheese. We love our beer. And if you want to try deep fried anything you want, you got to come to Wisconsin. Our state, state fair will deep fry anything you want. It's pretty fun. So come visit us. I do have three kids. I always like to start off by saying my kids are my, 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 my life and my wife. It tells They kind of keep you sane. They also keep you, I think, honest, right? They kind of tell you like it is, right? There are days you have a horrible day and you come home. And they're like, Papa, you're so sweet. We love you. And you're like, oh, I feel good. And there are days where you're like, man, I suck. <laughs> and bad outcomes. You're like, I'm not a good doctor. And then you come home and like, well, Papa, we love you still, right? So it's kind of nice to kind of have that kind of equality there. But they grow up fast, guys. They really grow up fast. So my PSA today is if you have kids, this is them. This is actually a couple of years ago, but it goes like that. So make sure you spend time as much as you can with your family. And I think it's important to have an outside interest. This is my band called Funkadesi. We got to play at Academy of Ophthalmology recently as well in Chicago, but it's a mix between Indian funk and reggae. This is me and the keyboards. We like to mix a lot of different styles of music. And our, our motto is one family, many children. Try to find what, what binds us. There's more that we have in common. And there's more that we have in common and less that separates us. So it's really fun trying to find what we have in common to kind of engage each other. That's kind of helping me in my private practice as well. So it's uh, kind of a fun outlet I have. And I want to also give a little credit and, and homage to my dad. My dad was a big part of my life and was my mentor. I came out of fellowship at Glaucoma at Duke, and I owe so much to my colleagues at Duke and my mentors there. But when I came into private practice, my dad helped me in so many ways. And his biggest, I think, I think, um, a contribution to me and my and who I am today is really making sure I would never stay compl complacent, keep pushing forward, keep trying to do better. And on the left is the first day I took over the, at the practice as an owner, and the right is the last day my dad was with me in surgery. So really emotional, but it's just great to give him credit because he was so much a part of my life. Uh, but back to Migs and while we're here today, uh, it's you know really interesting to see the change in the paradigm shift we've seen in glaucoma, especially now being out of practice for 18 years out of fellowship. There really is a change in paradigm. It's this interventional glaucoma, interventional mindset. But what does that mean? We, always talk, we hear these words kind of be played around a lot, but what does really interventional mindset mean? Well, to me, it's about quality of life and at the same time controlling IOP. We don't have to pick between one or the other, right? It's not about doing surgery for everybody, but it's the mindset of making sure we maintain a high quality life and we can control pressure at the same time. Another way to think of it is, can we actually address compliance, but do it in a safe way? And this mindset of being able to do both, address compliance, maintain high quality life, but to be aggressive with IOP early on is really the new change in paradigm. And we have so many products out there that allow us to do that and that allow us to tailor our products and our procedures for the right patient. And we have a number of different drops now. We have new molecules, latanoprost and bunode and atarsidil and others helping the outflow pathway. But we have, I think, a new resurgence and excitement of laser trabeculoplasty. MIGS we'll talk about today, of course, and drug delivery. I think with all these new products that we have available, along with some of the new molecules, we really can start to address the outflow facility, address the pathology directly, and of course, do it in a safe way as early as possible to maintain and prevent further progression physiologically, as well as, um, as well as, as, well as um, for patients' quality of life. But the impetus for all this, why have we seen such an incredible proliferation of technology is because of compliance, right? Compliance really does suck. And for anybody out there who's treating glaucoma, you know, you've seen this, right? Whether it's cost, side effects, whether it's forgetfulness, hard for patients to remember, physical attributes, whatever it might be, it is difficult, right? And that's the reason why we're seeing all these new technologies and whether patients can't put it in their eye. And I've seen some really scary stuff, guys. I'm talking like really frightening stuff. If you ever are bored and you want to just kind of do something fun in the office, have a patient take an artificial tear in front of you in the office. It's really kind of frightening of what people will do to get drops in their eyes. And this is real. And, you know, patients are taking this every day for the rest of their life. It's hard. But then you add things like dry eye to it, right? You had issues of compliance, but then all of a sudden, hey, you have a concomitant ocular surface disease. You add more bottles, guess what happens? Long and Rossi and others in Fechner have shown us that more bottles you add, 
the more risk you have of developing a common ocular surface disease, which is not good. The reason why is because Boudouin showed us a 30% reduction of, IOP, of, of compliance, rather, if you have a concomitant dry eye. So if you have dry eye, you're 30% less chance of being compliant long-term. Why is that important? We'll talk about it in a second, fluctuating IOPs. But also, if you add more bottles that contain benzoclonium chloride, BAK, you have an increased risk of causing more fibrosis of the trabecular meshwork, right? Fibrosis and scarring there, as well as the episcleral venous system and, the, and the, the collector channels. And thirdly, if you have scarring of the goblet cells in the conjunctiva, your trabs and your subcon surgeries like your Zens and others may not work as well too if you have more inflammation on the surface because of the BAK or in general, if you have an inherent dry eye. And I think it's important for all my colleagues out there to recognize dry eye, I know it's not easy to diagnose because we're so busy and we have so many things going on and not everybody has all the cool technologies. All you need is a history. Does a vision come and go? If someone says, doc, my vision comes and goes and I blink my eye, it's an unstable tear film. Assume it's ocular surface disease. Number two, if you have something like a rat and filter, sometimes with the cobalt blue light, it's hard to see the surface very well, but you can buy on Amazon a little yellow filter, which allows you to actually highlight the ocular surface really well. In our machines, we actually have a filter automatically on the machine, just press a button. And you can see how I can toggle back between this rat and filter and the cobalt blue light. And that filter really highlights that EBMD, you see that ocular surface disease, some of the poor tear from breakup time being so low there. This is something that has helped me so much because with the cobalt blue light, I miss a lot of these patients. But here we can see significant ocular surface disease, significant tear from instability just by using that filter. So something to think about, if you really don't have time, try that filter, it can save you a lot of time. And this is what we find post MIGS, right? Getting rid of the drop, even one drop can significantly affect the surface of the eye. This is a patient who had significant MGD and ocular surface disease on the, on the left, left slide here. On the right, after the treatment or after taking them off the glaucoma drops and after MIG surgery, you see how much better the surface of the eye is. That is a significant difference as well. And that can help quality of life, patient's satisfaction, also stability of their long-term control in a lot of patients as well. And the reason why this is important, because we mentioned earlier, compliance sucks. That can lead to potential for more fluctuating IOP. Look at the advanced glaucoma interventional study. What did that show us? The more you fluctuate over time, the more likelihood you have of progression of visual fields. And that's what shows us here, more than three millimeters of fluctuation, more progression of visual fields. On the right here, what does it show us? It says, okay, if you have a pressure of 11 in the study versus pressure down of 20 in the bottom, right? If you have a pressure of 11, but you've fluctuated more than three millimeters of mercury, you had a 30% progression rate. Incidentally, that's the same progression rate as if you had high pressures. If you had low fluctuation and low IOP, 9% progression. So this is why those patients who are more moderate, severe, let's say, and they're still progressing at a pressure of 12, you're like, why are they still progressing? Well, that could be why. They may be fluctuating. So we're not always seeing those pressures out of the office. Or again, we all know patients take drops just before they come in. So they seem great, but they go home and it's up and down. And, and we now have data that really does support this idea that maybe drops aren't always a better way in terms of controlling glaucoma long-term. The light trial, we've beaten this pretty, that pretty, pretty hard on patients, right, or on, on our colleagues. Light study, light trial. It's an important trial because it really did show us, and Gus Godzard's work and all those in the UK have shown us first-line SLT versus latanoprost, showing us the same efficacy, same reduction of IOP, but the SLT group needed less amount of drops to get to target pressure. Well, guess what happens at three years? We found that in three years, less patients needed cataract surgery. No one in the SLT group needed glaucoma surgery, but 11 in the, in the drop group needed it. Looking down below, visual field progression, less patients progressed on visual fields in the SLT group versus the drop group, despite the same IOP. This is showing us that drops independently and poor compliance can be an independent risk factor. So my challenge to everybody out there, including myself, are drops really safer, guys? I don't know. I mean, I look at these pictures and I've seen this. I've been around for 18 years out of fellowship. I'm telling you, it's real, right? Periocular changes, fat pad loss, MGD, allergic reactions, hyperemia, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of issues that can happen. So you have these drops long-term may not be safer, right? And so this is what's changed in me and my philosophy and what's really interventional glaucoma has changed for me has been my definition of controlled glaucoma. For me, it used to be, if your nerves, are, if your nerves are, are stable, your pressures are where I want you to be at this time, and your visual fields are fine, guess what? You're in control. But now I add this, quality of life and the likelihood of someone staying on that regimen long-term. If I think someone has a poor chance of staying on that glaucoma regimen long-term, that person is not controlled. Like this lady here, if I see someone here, sorry, it's in Spanish, <laughs> but it's sorry. If this patient here has you know, perfect pressures, visual fields are stable, but guess what? 
they're having an eyelid that's like that, that's not controlled glaucoma. That patient is likely not gonna stay on that regimen long-term, not gonna be a good chance of that person being controlled. So this is why we have to pay attention to what our patients are telling us every day. Every single day, patients are coming to our office, they're telling us stuff like that. If they say to me, hey, Dr. Paul, do you have any samples? I really need a sample again this month. They're telling you, I can't afford that Latanoprost generic, even $5, too much for me, right? Or if they say, yeah, doc, I have to blink my eye every time I read for five minutes, or I have to watch TV, I have to blink for every few minutes because my eyes are watering. Guess what? They have ocular surface disease. Let's pay attention to that. Let's take them off, away, away some of their offending agents, treat the dry eye, whatever you need to treat with, right? Or if they say, yeah, I can't remember the color of my medication. If you say, Mrs. Smith, you've been on drop for, let's see, five years now, and you can't remember, it's a blue top drop twice a day. That's scary, right? But that's real. And that tells you this patient probably is not as compliant as you think they are as well. So we got to listen to our patients because they're telling us all day long. And the problem is we kept waiting and waiting and kind of dealing with those issues because we didn't want to deal with this, right? It was like, okay, drops are safer because this is worse, right? I've had these things. I've done traps, I've done tubes, and I've seen blood leaks, blood litis. I've seen overhanging avascular large blebs, dysthesias, et cetera. It's not fun. But now with these other MIGS devices that we'll talk about today, we have the ability to help decrease the pressure, decrease drop burden, and not have those side effects. And that's really the new change. And so the mindset for me and the mindset for, I think, a lot of colleagues who are doing a lot of MIGS is that if you have a cataract patient, especially, and they have glaucoma, it's not that you have a, a patient who has cataract and just happens to have glaucoma. To me, the philosophical change is I have a glaucoma patient now who happens to have a cataract, and the cataract is just an excuse to go in and take care of the glaucoma. That is the mindset I have now with interventional glaucoma, and it gives us more control back to us. And so MIGS really has sparked this huge new excitement and really a proliferation of technology, our excitement and our understanding of mechanism of action. Where is the pathology? Is it the TM? Is it the canal? Is it the distal channels? These are questions that we didn't really care about when we were just doing trabs and tubes only because it didn't matter. But now it does because of these different technologies that we have. And more non-glaucoma specialists are doing glaucoma and glaucoma treatment and follow-up. That's exciting because these earlier mild to moderate patients, we address them earlier when the particle pressure is higher, we have a less chance of them likely of progressing to needing a traver tube, which is what we all want. I would love to never have to do a traver tube if I can. Not there yet, but it would be, it would be really nice if we could. And the hallmark of MIGS, I know this is kind of older slides here, but this is, I think, important to, rec to remember. It is a key hallmark, safety, less tra trauma to the target tissues, keeping options open for long-term and other, let's say, surgical options need be, like, say, an incisional surgery if need be. But it's scary that we still have a lot of colleagues who aren't doing surgery. This is about a couple of years old now, but in 2021 data showing us that, and this is market scope, showing us that really about 40% of our comprehensive cataract surgeons aren't offering MIGS right now. So I think there's still a disconnect. And part of the reason why I think that's happening is because a lot of surgeons aid are having a hard time with getting a good view, the time and effort and the reimbursements have been an issue, of course. But number two, I think is just the, I think comfort level, the confidence that are the MIGs going to get me to where I want to get to? Are we going to have that confidence that's going to do what we said it's going to do? And we'll talk about some of the data to give you that confidence as well. Now, I'm going to focus a lot of my talk here the next few minutes on really the conventional outflow pathway, all the different devices. Now, we have subconj, like Zen and others. We also have new supraciliary stents that we're working on. Some things are already approved now. And of course, we have ciliobladal, like ECP and others. But let's focus on the conventional pathway. We have the stents, we have the viscodilating procedures, and we have the cutting, stripping kind of removal stuff. Regardless of any of these devices, if you look at all the data sets out there that have been published, the bottom line is they're all going to get you to the middle teens. The magic number literally is 15. If you look at all these different data sets out there, they all seem to kind of rest at 15, 16 range on less meds, anywhere from 20 to 60% less meds. And I'm going to show you some of that data, but the bottom line is it's not necessarily which is the right one for every patient. It's which one you feel comfortable as a surgeon. It's which one is the best for that patient, their anatomy, their physiology, your comfort level, their indication that they are a cataract patient. You can do a stent if they're a pseudophagic or a phagic patient. At least right now, we have to do a non-stent procedure, although it's changing soon as well. But that's really the bottom line. You're going to get to the middle teens with almost all of these conventional pathway MIGs. So the key is really understanding what's the expectation for the patient. When I look at a patient myself, my goals may be different for each patient. My first goal for some people may be just get the pressures down. You're Mrs. Smith, your pressure's 28, you're on three meds. I don't care if you're still on three meds. I want your pressures down. And if you're on the meds, great. If I can get them off, even better. But some people, it's like, hey, let's just reduce the medication burden. Your pressure's 14 on a PGA. 
you know what? I don't mind it for 16. This gets you off that PGA. Really common call I used to get all the time was like, hey, Paul, that MIGS of choice didn't work. Why not? Well, pressure was 15 and now it's 18. Oh, really? They went up. You're on a medication again, huh? No, they're off the medications, but the pressure is two points higher than when they were on it. That's still a benefit. So the medication burden reduction is a big part of the definition of success. And we found about four minutes of savings per tech per patient with every drop that we were able to get rid of. So if you can get rid of a drop, you have less callbacks from pharmacies, callbacks from patients, less verification of their follow visits. Are they on the right medication? Do they need refills, et cetera? And that can save staff and of course, patients, a lot of, a lot of heartache, costs and side effects as well. So really, really key to understand what's your goal for the, for the uh, surgery. Another, I think, key factor, like we said earlier, is how do you get a good view? I think a lot of surgeons stress or are kind of struggling with getting that good, what we call on fast view, because the key is to understand not just anatomy, I'm just going to fast forward here, but to understand really how to get that view where the TM is facing you, this on fast view. So knowing your anatomical structures, but taking the time in surgery to make sure you get that view. Here's an example where I'm turning the head a little more and turning the eye. See that, that nice red line there? That is a trabecular meshwork. But see right now, the TM is kind of facing down. I'll say, patient, turn a little more nasally. Look at that. All of a sudden, you see a beautiful, beautiful blue or reddish line there. And that line was facing me. You want the, the TM to kind of face you where you can like write a, a book on it, right? You want to be able to see it right facing you. Here, if I go zoom in more, refocus, and there we go. Having the patient turn a little bit more, you see that red line there. That's on FOSS. Here's an example where it looks like I can see the trabecular meshwork there. The TM is right there, right? But look what happens if I say turn a little bit more nasally. So I tell the patient, look to your left, or look what happened. Bam. All of a sudden, you have a nice, beautiful on fast view. That is so important. I'll do it one more time here. Here's before. It looks like you can see trabecular meshwork, but if I just tell the patient to turn a little bit more, that is on fast. The more on fast you are, the easier it is for any of these mixed procedures to seat well in the canal, whether it's cutting, whether it's a stent, et cetera. You want to have that beautiful perpendicular view and approach to the angle. That is so important. The other thing is too, is really, this is an earlier video from one of my first Einstein G1 cases, but it's talking about how we can push on the wound sometimes, right? Here I'm pushing on the wound and I'm pushing viscoelastic out of the eye. The cornea is starting to get some folds. You can't see. So these are small nuances that do take time, but understanding these nuances very quickly, you start to appreciate how to avoid these issues. And then the view becomes a lot more straightforward. Another important concept is knowing anatomy. Here's a patient who had a history of narrow angles had cataract surgery, and I'm trying to do a, a excisional goniotomy here. But the question is, where is the TM, right? I'm thinking, wait, that looks brown up there. That's got to be TM. But I see brown here. Is that sort of body band? Is that maybe the TM? Is there maybe some PAS? Is this kind of some, some fibrosis going on? So I said, you know what? Maybe let me go ahead and do a little um, goniocecalysis here. So I'm taking this blade here, and I'm just going to go ahead and push the iris down, and all of a sudden, look. There's a trabeculate meshwork. So it's, it's easy to get fooled sometimes. So it's, it's, this is the small nuances of MIGS to understand your anatomy, get a good view, and then the rest of the procedure is a lot more consistent. And regardless of which procedure you do, they all the skill sets are very similar between the various devices. But now I have a beautiful view here, and now I can perform my excisional goniotomy here. I'm just going to fast forward here. You can see there. Now I'm just going to go ahead and just glide this little device here and create that nice white opening you see there which is the excisional goniotomy for this patient. But knowing anatomy is important. Another pearl I've learned over time, which I think hopefully can help a lot of you, it's gonna look barbaric, everybody, you think I'm crazy. My dad taught me this procedure and this works so well. You see, I'm not using a speculum actually, but I'm also using a 606 suture to place these episcleral bites to the, to the, uh, through the episclera here. This is done topically for my routine cataracts and my MIGS procedures. I just go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, bam, and we're done. These I, I clamp the 606 sutures to the drape. These eyes do not move. They have perfect counter-traction. Here I'm making my initial incision here for my surgery, my cataract surgery. The eye does not move away from me. I have perfect counter-traction. I can do my capsulotomies. All the cataract can be done without having the patient look at the light, move here, move, move to your left. But the best is when I do my glaucoma MIGS, when I turn my scope in the head, the head and the scope are perfectly aligned and they don't move. Now I can loosen those to have the person move on their own if I want, but otherwise I can keep it straight. And therefore now when I do my MIGS, I don't get, tor I don't get any uh, torsion. I can go ahead and no torquing of the eye. When I put my stent or my, let's say, viscodilating devices, the eye stays perfectly still. So something to think about, especially if you're trying out MIGS for the first time, that can help a great deal. Another concept I want to talk to you about here in this rapid fire is understanding why not all MIGs are the same or all MIGs will work in every patient. 
It depends on where the resistance to outflow is. I talked about mechanism of action before. What we do know from many different data sets out there, this is Haiyan Gong's work, showing us that 50% of our patients who have POAG have a collapse or herniation of the canal in blocking the ostea of the collector channels. The top is a beautiful open Schlem's canal and collector channel here. On the bottom is a blocked, a herniated uh, TM blocking the ostea of the collector channels. So if you have, let's say, some stenting here and here or microgoniotomies here and here, but there's no opening here, guess what? you're not gonna have the effects you want because the osteas are blocked, the collector channels, there's no access to it as well. So everybody's different in terms of how patent it is and where the collector channels are located. So there's some, there's some uneven distribution of where the collector channels are. In fact, what we found now with more data and Alex Wong's done some great work showing us that a lot of our collector channels are in the nasal quadrants, which is why when we do our goniotomies and our stenting, et cetera, we're, we're working on that 90 to 100 degrees, you wonder, does it have enough power? Well, if you look here, even in healthy eyes, majority of the collector channels are in that nasal quadrant. So if we can access two or three of those, there's a good chance we have significant efficacy. And that's the key, not having to always do 360, but getting good access to a two or three of those nasal uh, collector channels may help us. And I think the data supports that. Let's show the data. So let's talk about a few of the data sets out there that I'm going to rapid fire through because it's important to, to understand that. Now, this is a study that was done for the iStent Inject. This is a paper I published along with, uh, with Sarkissian and Samuelson and others based upon the phase three data of the iStent Inject. In the iStent Inject data, we randomized the patients to cataract surgery alone versus cataract with a stent, and we did washed out baseline IOPs. And in this study we did here, this publication, we just segregated those patients, separated them into groups of patients who had unmedicated baseline IOPs of 25 or less, 25 to 30, or greater than 30. And what we found in the cataract alone group, which is the blue, you maxed out your effective IOP of the cataract surgery alone. But 5 to 5.8 is really all you're going to get, no matter what your baseline unmedicated IOP was. But in the red, as you increase the unmedicated baseline IOP, the ISTEN group, you see an increase in the actual magnitude of IOP reduction showing us that we have an increase in outflow facility. Now, we're not washing people out in real life, so we don't know the difference. But if you look at this baseline here, you see that the iStent is different than what cataract surgery is doing. So therefore, there is a difference. And if you look at the data out there in the iStent in general, there's been a number of data sets that five to eight year data showing us that your target pressures are gonna get down to that middle teens at 14, 15, 16 range, and on less medications, anywhere from 20 to kind of 75% reduction of medications. So you're not, Going to get down to 10 or 12, and that's key. Majority of the time, it's the middle temper teens on less medications, which is why the mild to moderate patient's perfect for these type of patients. And this is to show you the example of power. Now, these are 80 micron stents, the iStent injects, not very wide and very large. So the question is, do they have the power to really do what we want them to do as well? So here, this is the second stent I placed. These are the iStent inject Ws, the wider flange, help helps prevent from over implantation. I'm just going to show you here, you see a little reflux of blood there. I like seeing reflux. It really indicates you have a good uh, exposure to the connector channels, but look at the blanching. Blanching literally almost 180 degrees. So with two 80 micron stents, in this case, you see significant blanching. And that's because the collector channels are probably accessible. There's probably not a lot of collapse of the canal. We have good access to the collector system. And so therefore, everybody's anatomy is different, which is why the response may be different. And don't be fooled. If you don't get blanching, it does not mean you're not going to have a good effect. But when you see it, it's kind of nice to show that. If you look here, this is with one stent placed here. We can see the heme right there. One eye stent placed here. Eye stent inject. Look at the blanching. Ready? As I do my INA, watch this. Ready? Three, two, one, pew, all gone. I love it. It's like an eraser. But that's the power. So depending on the anatomy, the pathophysiology of every patient, you may get some significant power with these 80 micron stents. The other question I think that comes up in a rapid fire here is, will we, are we really helping quality of life? Because we anecdotally would tell our, our, our colleagues and our patients, hey, I think we're helping your quality of life by doing a cataract stent. But have we done that? This is a, a paper that Tom Samuelson and me and Blake and others published last year as well, showing us, again, phase three trials, looking at the OSDI scores and BFP25s of the iStent Inject uh, pivotal trials. We found in the orange was the iStent cataract versus gray to cataract alone. More patients had an improvement in quality of life, VFP25, and better dry eye scores in the stent versus the cataract alone group. On the right is that those patients who were off of medications had the greatest improvement in quality of life compared to those who were on medications. If you look at the VFQ25, you see here a breakdown, better driving, better ocular pain, better general health and general vision. Again, likely due to the fact that more patients were off of glaucoma drops in the stent cataract group versus the cataract alone group as well. So we now have published data that you can tell your patients, guess what? 
we are having a better chance of improving quality of life if we go ahead and put those tents. Another update I want to make sure I all recognize is that recently, just about a couple months ago, the FDA approved the iStent Infinite, which is three iStent injects into and with one loader uh, for a refractory population of patients. This is a publication, a presentation rather, that I presented last year, which basically showed us that with three iStent injects in a patient population who had previously failed TRABs or tubes or some glaucoma incisional surgery and failed MTMT, maximum tolerated therapy, we can actually reopen or readdress the conventional pathway. 60 or sorry, 76% of patients got 20% reduction of IOP with the same or less medications. Again, post-TRAB failed TRABs or tubes. 53% of patients had a 30% reduction of IOP, 30% reduction with the same or less medications. And if you look at the MTMT group, 80 plus percent of patients had 30% reduction of IOP with same or less medications. So the question is, can we reopen the conventional pathway after TRAB or tube? At first I thought no, but after this data, and I was part of the study, yeah, you can. It's pretty impressive. So now we're having a standalone indication for iStent injects in a refractory population patient. I think this is really going to help a lot of those patients avoiding needing a second TRAB or tube, et cetera. And this is a video here showing us what those iStent injects look like here. This is the first one here. We placed three of them about two clock hours away. So a little bit of a nuance here because, again, you're having plus three of them. You want to be as far apart as possible to really engage and to access as many of those collector channels as possible. So I'm going all the way out here, way to the outside here, and you're going to put the third one way out here. So there's a little nuance to injecting these. But, again, you have unlimited clicks with this loading system as well. So having three injects, I think, might give us an opportunity to really help a lot of these patients. All right, let's move on to the hydrus, another stent, right? This is a stent that does a little differently. It actually scaffolds three clock hours of the canal. And we talked about the canal being collapsed in some patients and it also bypasses TM. So here's a video of just me making a paracentesis. You wanna make a secondary incision to allow the loader to follow the natural curvature of the angle. Now turning the head and the scope a little bit more, I want that on fast view there. Let's take a time, let me fast forward here. What you're gonna see here as I enter, I'm gonna engage the TM with my hydrus there score it just gently, keeping constant pressure, and it just advancing the wheel, letting it clamshell open up and letting that stent feed in beautifully. I think that's a great verification. I love the stent because it does tell you exactly where you are. If you feel resistance, you're probably not in a good spot. You can see it in the canal. You can see where it's going. You see that blanching there? The, basically, the distribution of the hydrus is where we see the blanching of the episcopal vessels. So pretty impressive here as well. I'm going to show you another video here showing us, again, another hydrus here where I'm just going to go ahead and engage the TM. Hold it there, advance the wheel, the clamshell opens up automatically, and right there you go. So it can be a very efficient procedure, but it's also very good to verify. You know exactly where you are as that, that stent goes into the canal. But the question, are we really scaffolding it? Well, now we have some data uh, and some uh, intraoperative OCT. And in this video, I don't have it here, but I actually have intraoperative OCT evidence that we are scaffolding the canal with the hydrus in the distribution of where it's actually in the canal. So we are seeing a significant increase in the size of the canal with the hydrus. The question is, what does it mean clinically, right? Well, at the end of the day, can we get our patients off of medications? Well, if you look at the market scope data, majority of our patients, about 50% of our patients are on just one medication. You look at those one medication patients in the, in the 48 months or four years after surgery, guess what? 70% of patients are off of medications. Same thing we see actually at five years out as well. You look at the need for incisional surgery in the Hydrus Horizon trial, patients up front were told it'll be followed for five years. They had 80% retention of the patients over five years. Incredible data. In fact, they got the highest designation of the academy for their quality of data. And in the data, they looked at the need for needing incisional surgery in the study. In patients who had the hydrus, they had less chance of needing incisional surgery, 61% risk of secondary interventions in general with the hydrus. But the most important question for me, or most important factor, was two-thirds of those patients who progressed to needing some type of incisional surgery, guess what? They were mild to begin with. So if you have a mild patient in the beginning of the study and they progress to needing incisional surgery within less than five years, that's scary. It teaches us, though, you can't be fooled just because someone's mild that they're not going to be, we have to be as aggressive. Don't have to worry about them as much. They can progress pretty rapidly. Gus Guzzard at Moorfields did some great work showing us that we see less visual field progression in the horizon trial, in the, in the hydrus group versus the cataract surgery alone group as well. Even if you match the, uh, the, the IOPs and match the, the drops, significant decrease in reduction of, IOP, of visual field for almost 50% reduction. So we are now showing that MIGS itself compared to cataract surgery alone can reduce the risk of progression over time. And the reason I bring this up, this is the OATS trial, right? You're like, why would I bring up OATS now, guys? Here's why because we get fooled, right? Even in ocular hypertension patients, the slope of progression for five years 
didn't change much, right? 60 months didn't change much. Looks what happens though, at about five or six years, that slope change. Those who are not treated, obviously see a significant increase in slope of progression. This is what I mean by don't be fooled. It just takes time. Eventually, you'll find these patients come to bite you because you waited too long. We didn't appreciate compliance. And it's happened to me way too often. Over the next 10 minutes, I want to talk to you about just a couple more things. Talk about goniotomies and canal plasties. We're seeing a big resurgence in the, these new products to help viscodilate, perform canaloplasty, and microgoniotomies and excisional goniotomies. So there's a number of devices. I'll try to go through some of these really quickly here. We know about the iTrack catheter for many years. The iTrack is a device that really helps kind of, again, uh, break those herniations within the canal and give us the amount of control to really release and to viscodilate as much viscoelastic as we want in the canal. So we basically cannulate the canal here and we go ahead to the other side. And once we're on the other side of that red light, you know exactly where you are. We re retract it back and we basically click, click, click. We have a technician on the other end clicking a viscoelastic about three or four clicks per clock hour to viscodilate, to really open up the canal and the distal channels. The question is, and I think a lot of naysayers will say, really, are you truly opening up the canal and the distal channels with this visco delivery device. Well, guess what? We can see with intraoperative the eye track catheter is really in the are. canal now. Sorry. I'm going to show you real quick here. On the right here, that is the catheter in the canal already. Okay. So we're already in the canal and the catheter is already passed. We're scanning right here, this big X, a uh, big box. Now, as I bring this blinking red light towards this box, look at the canal as I click, 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 and look at the size of that canal. All of a sudden, it gets bigger, becomes like a nice circle all of a sudden here. And see those black squiggly lines? Those black squiggly lines are the collector channels. So you can see real time as you click viscoelastic, you're stretching the TM. You see here, there's a TM pre, the TM post, it's stretched. These black squiggly lines, the collector channels have opened up and the circle here is much wider, much more circular after the catheter is removed. And we're seeing this now, even six months post-op, that you're not going to have the same size, but we're seeing that the collector channels are as big as they were even in intraoperatively as well. So this is something we're seeing now. Again, this is another patient with a collect the catheter in the canal. Here's with it out of the canal. You see how much bigger it is after viscodilating. And those bad black areas, that's the collector channels as well. So we're seeing this real-time evidence. Something new that's coming out, I was luckily down in Panama, with a bunch of colleagues. Zoom in here. and make sure I have a good and view. This, we is a were, this is a new device that's coming out called the iTrack Advance. This is approved in Europe already. This allows us to perform the iTrack catheter or the canaloplasty, but having a loading system now. So the efficiency, the comfort level for surgeons, I think, will, will, be, will improve because now we can just use this device and advance a slider and let that catheter go all the way around without having to manually feed it. And we can go ahead and do that. And now we can still do the same benefits. We have a red light to know where it is. And we can retract it back now. And we retract it back on the other, on the other side. And we have our technician going click, click. You see the red light there? Click, click, click on the other side to release viscoelastic. And now look there. That blanching, that blanching is before I even went in with my INA. That's all viscoelastic delivery blanching. That's how much force is going in to the episcopal venous system as well. Pretty cool stuff as well. And Dr. Kiyami's done some great work showing us down to the middle teens around 15. After the procedure is done, this is a two, I want a year and a half data, and also showing about from two down to 0.6 meds as well. So you can get down to middle teens on less medication burden reduction. The Omni is another device that I, I use a lot as well. This is another device that's a catheter that allows us to break those herniations and viscodilate. The difference between this and the iTrack catheter is the iTrack catheter, you have a device separately where you can click, 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 viscoelastic. Here, as you retract it back, it's automatically releasing viscoelastic in the canal. And so I'm advancing it, retracting it back. I release viscoelastic. And here I'm going to re-advance it and perform an otomy. So the otomy, you can do viscodilation, say 360 viscodilation and do a 180 degree otomy or do 180 otomy, 180 viscodilation like I'm doing here. And so I'm just going to go ahead and perform my otomy. I did my viscodilation first. Now I'm just going to go ahead and perform my otomy. And the one I love so much about this is watch the blanching. I'm just going to remove viscoelastic with manual INA and look at that blanching. It's like, oh my gosh. See this whole area there, completely blanched in the area that we did our otomy so, and our viscodilation. So pretty cool to see that as well. But this is the Omni device as well. You can do, again, that was 180 viscodilation and otomy. This is a procedure I'm doing here, being basically 360 viscodilation and performing about a 90 degree otomy. So you can titrate the amount of otomy depending on the severity and number of medications that you want as well. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. This is the iPrime device, which is a device that 
the device is uh, my, my Glock host, the which is their version as well, which can viscodilate. And you can also decouple the visco delivery with the ca catheter advancement as well. So it's there, uh, just slowly we're la launching this in the United States as well. So another device too, that does very similar to what the Omni device is, but is, it's actually um, helping to decouple the visco delivery with the advancement. This is showing you the Omni data. This is the uh, this is a uh, data from the cataract uh, combination of the Gemini trial. This is actually the six month data. They have a year data that's published also, showing us down to the middle teens with cataract surgery and the uh, Omni uh, with less medication burden from 1.8 down to 0.4 here at six months. Similar findings at one year has been published as well. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on here to the Streamline device. Again, this is rapid fire, guys. Streamline is a device that also I have this a is from Nathan Radcliffe. This is a device where you press the button and you're basically releasing viscoelastic. You're creating a microgoniotomy. So you press this button, makes a little hole, hole in the, the TM, and it pushes seven microliters of viscoelastic into the canal with significant force. Now, this is a cool video. So you made this otomy. You see a reflux of blood there? Now, watch. Nate, Nate's going to go about three o'clock hours away to another area. And he's going to go ahead and press the button. Now, watch what happens. You see viscoelastic come out of that otomy. So you see it traveled within the canal and came all the way out of the otomy. That shows you how much force is actually being released with this visco delivery device. And we're seeing some pretty good, good data here as well, creating these microgoniotomies and viscodilation as well. Here's one of my cases, just to show you, I do them too. <laughs> and so this is one of my cases too. I approach the TM, you press this lever, releasing viscoelastic, come out. You can do a, do a two or three of these as well. You're releasing about 70, see, seven or so microliters per clicks. So you can do about 28, you can do four of these. And you can open it up even more. You can enlarge the otomy to make it more of an excisional going otomy uh, if you want to as well. So you can titrate how much of the otomy you want to do by just moving it left and right and making it bigger if you need to as well. This is early, early data that's been published as well, showing us down again, the middle teens on less medication, about 50% less medications. Again, this is only six month data. As we all know, we need longer term, larger end, but we, we've seen in our data sets also very similar results to what they're showing here as well. Don't forget excisional goniotomy. I mean, this is the KDB here. I think it's great, especially for pseudophagic patients, patients who already had cataract surgery, patients with post-LPI, patients with strange anatomies, patients where I, I think, let's say, there's steroid-induced glaucoma, or I think it's TMM-based or pigmentary. I think a KDB or some excisional goniotomy, like trabectome or whatever you use, is a great opportunity. And here I am, you can see those, those little areas of heme. Those are collector channels. We're seeing access to those collector systems beautifully there, which I love seeing. If you look here, as we go ahead and uh, do our INA. You can see here, look at these vessels here. Watch as I go in the eye to remove the uh, viscoelastic here. Watch this. This is so cool. Ready? Here we go. It's my favorite part. Ready? Watch this vessel there. Yep, it's gone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, so much fun. Anyway, for the sake of time here, I'm just going to fast forward here. But again, I do this a lot. I think it's a great opportunity to help for those patients as well who may have some issues with the TM-based uh, uh, disease. And you can see here, you can actually get, I'm just going to fast forward through here, you can get a nice clean excision. This is uh, just a strip of TM I just pulled out, showing you how cleanly you can excise that TM with the KDB. There's a new version of this uh, by a company called Site Sciences, which is called Scion, a very similar device, also creating an excisional goniotomy that I also had the pleasure of doing. For the sake of time, I don't have a video here, but again, data shows middle teens around 15 on less medication burden as well. Uh, more uh, medication burden if you do a K KDB standalone because you had more medications to start with, but you're down about 50% from four down to two or so uh, if you do a standalone for those patients as well. A couple more topics here before I have to end. I know I'm almost undone here, but a couple new products coming out. We're in a study right now for something called eczema laser trabeculostomy. And this is making these micro 210 micron channels through the TM with a uh, eczema laser. And so here we go. This is one of my first cases here with this laser. Um, I'm in the phase three trials right now at the time of cataract surgery. You can see as I, I engage the TM perpendicular fashion, like an eye stand actually, pushing slight dimpling there and just pressing this button here. And you see a little flash of light. That's the micro channels being made with this eczema laser. And you can see it was going to be 10 of these going across the nasal angle. And you can see I'm making the 10 channels there. And you can see a nice reflux of blood through those as well. And if you look here, as I fast forward, you see the vessels there are blanched. So here you can see that vessel up there. Watch what happens. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> so much fun. And I, I love putting toric lenses in these glaucoma patients. I think if you're not a big fan of multifocals for glaucoma, I totally understand. But monofocal torics, great opportunity for these patients who have glaucoma. I think we can really maximize the uh, quality of vision for these patients. And data from Berlin and Europe. 
has done some really good work with ELT showing us down that middle teens, 16 range or so from starting pressure in the middle 20s on less medications as well. So again, the common theme to all these mixed conventional pathway devices, they get down to the middle teens. Last couple devices here, this is the I-axis device by Glaucos, making microgoniotomies with a little twisting motion here. For the sake of time, I'm gonna fast forward. Here's one of my cases. Let me just go ahead and fast forward this, placing my two eye stents, but I'm gonna perform now these microgoniotomies. So I'm just gonna go ahead and with the device here, gonna twist back and forth, creating about 220 micron little openings here, twisting, 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 coming back out, creating an opening there. And you can create openings multiple areas. You can see here, make an opening there, making an opening here. So you can augment your little, let's say your stenting or your viscodilation with a couple of extra of these microotomies to help, again, access more collector channels here. And you can see as I go in here, you see some good blanching as well of those vessels just completely wipe out all along the nasal quadrants here as well. So pretty cool. Again, blanching is my friend. I love blanching, a lot of fun. All righty. And just want to show you that video. And let's see. This is my little cool video here. But for the sake of time, I'm going to fast forward through all this here. But I think there's a really good chance that we have a good opportunity to mix different technologies, whether it's canal dilation with stenting, canal dilation, viscodilation, as well as some otomies, adding some, some inflow procedures like ECP great opportunities. In fact, ECP has been around for a long time. We see great data showing as ECP and the ISET injects, getting this extra point reduction of IOP and a little bit less medication burden uh, for this patient. So a great opportunity to combine it with the stenting and viscodilation devices as well. You can do stenting with it. This is a case here. I'm doing three, uh, 180 degree viscodilation here with the Omni device here. And I'm going to go ahead and finish that up. And then I'm going to go ahead and perform my hydrus here in this case. So I'm just going to go ahead and enter here and advance the hydrus in the same area that a viscodilator. The theory is you're breaking herniation, flushing the distal channels, and placing your stent to keep the patent uh, long-term. Here I am doing a viscodilation here with the, this is 360 viscodilation with the Omni device, and then placing my two eye stent injects, here's my first inject, and then placing my second one there. And the idea again is to help patency long-term, but you're flushing the system out, breaking those herniations initially to have a better chance, hopefully, of outcomes. And for the sake of time here, I'm just gonna fast forward and show you some of our data which basically shows us here that we presented ASCRS a couple of years ago at one year out, we were able to get down still same teens, middle 14 to 15 range, but we had less medication burden reduction or actually more medication burden reduction when we combined them. So for me, when I have a patient on multiple meds, that's when I start combining. So last slide here, this is my algorithm. If I have patients who are not controlled with glaucoma, I'll say compliance is an issue. Do they have a cataract? Do they not? If they have a cataract, I think about stenting because the time right now we have to place those stents. If they're mild glaucoma on one medication, two medications, I'll do a stent, eye stent, hydrus, whatever it might be, right? If they're on, let's say, two, three, or four medications, I'll start combining viscodilation with it to hedge my bets to get them off that medication. If they're more moderate, severe glaucoma or moderate glaucoma, let's say plus, I'll put stents with the viscodilation automatically, no matter how many drops they're on. If they're on multiple drops, I'll add a little otomy too. So I'll titrate the amount of otomy depending on how severe they are. If they've had never had cataracts or they're phakic and they're more mild to moderate, I try to do viscodilation alone, just canalplasty alone save the TM for later on if I can, for a stent or whatever else might need be long-term. If they're more moderate, severe, I'll add a little bit of an otomy also. I very rarely do 360 uh, trabecular otomies now, mostly 90 to 180 degrees. Our studies show very little ad additional benefit doing 360 versus just doing a 90 to 180 degree otomy. If a pseudophagic, I tend to do more otomies with it because the next step likely in those patients can be a trab. But if they're more mild, I'll still do viscodilation, just do a little otomy if I need to as well. But this is kind of my general uh, algorithm as well. And at the end of the day, management, if you see a hyphema, key, don't increase steroids. Hyphemas can happen. If we pressurize the eye intraoperatively, do a slow decompression, leave a little bit higher, you very rarely get a hyphema. If you do, they will go away. Don't increase steroids, it's not bleeding, it's just reflux of blood. So very important there. And my last slide here, I promise, is to make sure you don't give up on the idea that one medication reduction is important. Earlier we addressed glaucoma, the higher the target pressures are, the better these conventional pathway MIGs will get us there. And don't minimize poor compliance. It'll catch up with you. So anything you can do, whether it's SLT, drug delivery, or in this case, in this video here, MIGs, really important to address it somehow, right? And listen to the patients because they're telling us all the time that they're not compliant. For the sake of time, I'm going to end there because I know I'm already over. Uh, but I hopefully will have some, I'm sure, some questions from the audience. I'd love to answer them as well. And Thank you so much for the opportunity to spend time with you today. I appreciate the app. Take care, everybody.
Dr. Singh, can I just tell you, I'm incredible. If you could, I know that you just saw what the feed has been like amongst the audience, the incredible, uh, the gratitude and appreciation for what you have brought, um, just starting from your perspective, because you really have been from the grassroots, all of your input and being involved with all the various studies as it relates to MIGS and as you've continued to contribute. So to have you part of this and to have your input has been incredible. So thank you so much there. I <laughs> have a lot of feedback come in and we'd love to hear your perspective because in practice, you are working with a lot of referring doctors. And I know you take care of a lot of doctors and ODs are always referring and you're always collaboratively managing patients and putting patients first. When are you considering medicines versus SLT first? Because this is such a hot topic that you brought up within your lecture. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I will say that I think that SLT for me, in my opinion, should be offered as a first line. Doesn't mean I have to force it on patients. I think giving them an opportunity to have the opportunity to think about drops is always important too. But I think it's important for us to recognize, as I mentioned earlier, compliance really does suck. It is hard for us as providers, optometry, ophthalmology, as well as our patients to stay on medications. And we have enough data, as I mentioned earlier, to know that compliance independently is a risk factor for progression of glaucoma. We know that rate rise in IOP is from TM, TM dysgenesis. So that's the actual pathology. So we can directly address it with a laser that's safe and effective and still gives us the opportunity if you need to put people on drops. It's a, kind of a why not more than why should we. As long as they're a good candidate, you can see the angle, we do gonioscopy. The, I think first line SLT makes a lot of sense. It helps too, as we mentioned late at, at the end there, less callbacks from patients, less time for our technicians to work up patients asking, are you on the right medication? Do you need refills? All those issues that we face as well. And I think that whole consistency of IOP, that control, that 24 hour fluctuation that we see in some studies can be an independent risk factor. So there's so many reasons why I wanna offer SLT, but I think so much of it has to do with how we, whether it's optometry, seeing the patient first, or us as the surgeons, telling patients directly, this is what I prefer for you. It's not about saying, you want this, you want this, you want this. We don't have premium IOLs. You do you have too many options. Patients just have a hard time knowing what to do. They want to know, what do you think, doctor? And I can tell them clearly, I believe strongly in my practice, standard of care is addressing the disease with a beam of light that can naturally rejuvenate the drain. If it doesn't work, we always have the opportunity for drops. And I think it's great for co-managing with optometrists, right? I mean, I have we have three optometrists in our practice who are well-versed and do a lot of my pre and post-op. We have optometrists in the community who refer. And it's great to refer because there's no issue there. You're like, hey, this is the target range. If they go above that range, they start to fluctuate. Just send them back to me. We can do a repeat SLT if we need to. Or we can think about drops if we don't think SLT is a good option. So I think there's very little risk, only upside when we offer SLT primary therapy. And one other question there. Now, there was also, we know that SLT, while it is repeatable, as you mentioned, it can sometimes have a short half-life where it may not be as effective after two years. Some people, even five years out, they're doing great, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's short-lived. So do you find that it is more short-lived or is it something that you see in your hands can have an efficacy that is a longer, like what do you, how do you counsel them in terms of the average lifespan of an SLT procedure? Well, that has a great point too. I think everyone is a little different. Uh, I think we know from our data, the light trial and others showing us that the earlier we address the pathology, the early, earlier we institute SLT, the better chance we have of those collector channels, the distal collector system to be actually patent. So what we found with Jindra and other studies showing us that actually five-year data looks really good if you do it earlier that you do it. So when I have a patient who's a new start, ocular hypertensive patient, early glaucoma, preparametric, never been on drops, I can tell the patient we have a good chance you're going to last anywhere between two and five years. In my, in my hands, with a greater than 50% chance after two to five years. But if you actually look at data on repeatability, we actually find that you can actually see that's the second and third treatments. We actually see that the first treatment did well the second treatment will do close to about 80 to 90% of the first treatment. 
So I do tell patients, we can always repeat this if we need to, but if we ever get to a stage, it's not about telling them exact numbers. It's saying, look, the idea is that if we need to, we can always go to drops. But like I said, this is such a safe procedure. If I repeat it and doesn't have any effect, then we go back to drops and we talk to drug delivery and other opportunities as well. But I do think the earlier we treat, I tell them this is a journey, Mrs. Smith. My job as a provider is a lot, is it until you, until you die is to keep you seeing well. And every, every, is every step that we take, any recommendation I have may be good for you at this moment. We may have to use other technologies and other devices later on if we need to, but I'm going to offer you what I think is safest and best for you at this time. And so I train my patients initially to know it's not just one way of treating glaucoma and it may change over time. And that's why follow-up is so important. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Before I forget, the raffle code is TED, as in thyroid eye disease, TED. And Dr. Singh, I really think that SLT is kind of first line MIGS. It was the beginning of MIGS. And thank you for your beautiful presentation oh. on MIGS for mild all the way through and your algorithm. And Dr. Singh, you really are a rock star in every <laughs> sense of the world. Uh. In glaucoma, out of glaucoma. I just appreciate you spending part of your Saturday with us. We're honored here in Eyes on 2023. Thanks again. Thanks, Liz. Thank you to everybody. Well done. Thank you so much.